evening, good evening. Good evening, God bless each and every one of you. Share if you care, share if you care, share if you care. Good evening. Good evening. Come on in. God bless you. God bless you. God bless each and every one of you, and thank you for tuning in again to another Wednesday now, Oak Grove NBC Apex, uh, Pastor Cobb, uh, amen, with you on tonight, and again, we are grateful to each and every one of you for joining us uh, and spending time with us on this evening, and certainly we trust that everyone's day has been well and productive, and that God has uh, continued to keep you and sustain you and to, to do what only he can do in your life. Uh, and to make uh, to make you whole, to make you clean, to make you uh, everything that he wants you to be. Uh, as we always begin on each uh, and every Wednesday, um, that uh, you would just be mindful, reminded uh, that our, to our Grow Whites, we are in 31 days of fasting and consecration. So let us uh, continue to uh, each day, uh, read the scriptures, um, uh, and to spend that quality time with, with, with God uh, and trust him for the results. However he wants to bless us, uh, we'll be satisfied. And also, uh, by way of reminders, we will be in revival again. Uh, for this will be our third Friday, uh, uh, which will be um, with Dr. Uh, Campbell uh, and her uh, great people, Dr. Barbara Campbell and her great people at Victory uh, in uh, Lillington and so uh, Victory Tab Tabernacle. And so we ask that you would please, ma'am, please, sir, you can join us on this Friday here at the Grove where God is blessing. And uh, also join us each and every Sunday at 12 o'clock. Uh, where we are in the series now uh, as it relates to family matters, the matters of the family. And so God is, we're just, we're just excited. We're just excited about what the Lord is doing. Um, and uh, to our grow bites, as always, uh, any other questions or what have you regarding what's going on here at the church, uh, please see your weekly uh, grow bite, uh, grow bite weekly news um, that you would uh, make sure that you are in the loop of what is going on. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. And God, we pray that, Lord, you'll just open up our hearts, our minds, our ears, uh, that we would be uh, receptive to your word. Uh, bless me, bless your people, bless those that are on the live, bless those that are watching the replay. God, just bless as only you can as we give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are uh, another week, another week of living a purpose-filled life. 
Um, another week of living a purpose-filled life. So we've been in this uh, for several weeks now. And uh, if you have not been a part of this, if you, you're just now catching up, uh, go back and watch the recaps uh, and uh, to get caught up to speed. Uh, and so we just want to uh, uh, just uh, dig back in, right back into where God would have us to be on tonight. And uh, we talked about uh, purpose one. Uh, the, the, the first purpose as we as we think about uh, living a uh, purpose filled life and understanding uh, what God desires for us to do. The first purpose uh, is that uh, our purpose is to know and to love God. And we talked about how God is love and certainly um, uh, how many people miss the most important thing uh, because they don't know who God is. And then the second purpose was that to, we need to understand that God formed me for his family. He formed me for his family. And so tonight, we're going to continue in that um, under that, that second purpose, uh, which is God formed me for his family, and uh, keep on moving. So when, so when we think about, and as we talk about God formed me for his family, we talked about on last week how uh, when God made us, he made the universe for us, and how the earth just sits uh, perfectly on an axis, because if it was one degree to the left or to the right, we would either freeze to death or burn up. But God has it perfectly situated. Uh, why? Because he is perfect in all his ways. And so we also talked about how we were, we have a spiritual family. Uh, when we become his sons and his daughters, our spiritual family will never, ever, never, ever, ever, it will never be demolished. Uh, our physical families will because our loved ones will, will you know, will die. Um, you know, uh, you know, things happen within our family structure, but with the spiritual family, that will be forever. So when we are born, we automatically we we are we automatically become members of not the spiritual family, but of the human race. Uh, we, we become members of the human race, and so when we think about the human race. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice to be born a human. You are born as a human uh, because you don't have a choice in that. If you are in the human race, uh, you are human. Uh, and that we have no control over. Uh, you were a member. Uh, we are members of our physical families because somebody chose to take you home. Uh, so when babies are born, they, they're taken home from the hospital or take you in. Uh, maybe, you know, someone has taken you in whichever way someone has to uh, take you home or take you in. But being a part of God's family is not automatic. I mean, let me say, because there, sometimes we are, oh, I'm a child of God. No, you were made by God. We, those that are children of God, obey him. Uh, that's a son and a daughter is obedient to their father. And so uh, being a part of God's family is not automatic. It is a choice. And so there are many people that are a part of a physical family, but not a part of God's family. And so uh, everybody is created by God. Uh, everybody is loved by God, but everyone is not necessarily a child of God because a lot of people choose to opt out of being a child of God. Uh, it does not, it's not sufficient enough to be born, but you must uh, give God your life. You must be uh, come adopted into his family in order to be a child of God. And then you walk thereby his precepts and his concepts, which is the word of God. God never chooses us to be adopted. God never chooses us to be adopted. You must choose to be a part of God's family. And so if we are, so what that is to suggest to us that if we become a, if we become a part of God's family, it is through adoption, but he does not make us. He does not make us become adopted. And this is why there's a heaven and there's a hell because those that are adopted, heaven is our home. But those that are not adopted, that's where they'll find their eyes in a fiery hell. So you must choose to become a part of God's family. It's a choice. Giving your life to Jesus is a choice. It is not uh, something that he makes you do. It's not God don't make you do. He's God enough. And you think about that. That choice is such a great choice because you would think that if God created us, he would make us. Uh, you know, be a part of his family. But God says, no, I'm God enough and I'm great enough. I'm going to give you a, a, a mind so that you can either choose me or you cannot choose me. And if you choose me, you go to heaven. But if you don't choose me, you go to hell. Um, and so uh, as we talk about the fact that we were formed 
uh, for God's family, uh, or God formed me for his family, uh, what is God's family? Let, let's, let's, let's start there on tonight. Uh, God's, what is God's family? First Timothy chapter three, verse 15 from the new century version says this, that family is the church of the living God, the support and the foundation of truth. Let me say it again. That family is the church of the living God, the support and foundation of the truth. So what is God's family? It is the church, not your church. I know we think about, oh, my church. No, no, no. The church, as we look at it from the standpoint of a biblical concept, is not about your place of worship. The church is a body of believers. And so when we talk about the church, amen, we're not talking about a building. We're talking about the body of believers. So the family is the church of the living God and it is the support and the foundation of truth. And those are two things that you want to pay attention to. It says that the church is the support and it is the foundation of truth. It is not an organization. The church is not an organization. I'm not, again, your physical church uh, is a organization. When we talk about the body of believers, it is not an organization. Uh, it is, amen, an organism. Uh, and so when we understand and as we talk about uh, the church and understand what it means, the church is not an institution. The church is not a political entity. No, no, it's not a business. It's not a society. But the church is literally God's family. And I know we oftentimes we think, well, because my, you know, my denomination, we believe in Jesus only over here. We baptize you this way over here. And a lot of times we, we, we go, okay, well, this is, you know, it's, it's about doctrine. We do it like this over here. We say you got to do nothing. And the reality is a lot of this stuff is just tradition and man. At yeah, the end of the day, it's just tradition and man. When we get down to the root of it, the church is God's family. The church is not an organization, but it is God's family. We are children of God, which makes us brothers and sisters. And so when we receive him through adoption, we become his sons and his daughters. And then those that have also become sons and daughters are now our brothers and sisters. So we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, let me still, let me go a step further because uh, Timothy says that the church is the support and the foundation of truth. So what happens when a building does not have support and foundation? It will collapse. OK, and so this is why sometimes we, uh, when we look at our society. We see collapse marriages. We see collapse uh, weather, collapse health. We see a lot of things that have just collapsed. And so without the support of God's family, it is dangerous, dangerously hard to make it. Now, you know, so, 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 you know, yeah, that's why you have some folks, I ain't, you know, that's why it's important for you to be a part of a local church. Again, um, you know, that does, you do need to give your gifts and talents to, uh, you know, I do believe that you should give your gifts and talents to a organization where you can, you know, you know, give them and serve unto the Lord. But more importantly, a church or the church is the body of believers. And so the question is, is not have you joined a church, have you first joined Christ and his church? Because Christ and his church is not, uh, you know, confined to your location, you know, uh, because God is everywhere. And so without the support of God's family, it's dangerously hard to make it. So if you are a believer, if you are a son, if you are a daughter, it is hard to make it uh, when you're around unbelievers, those that do not believe. You got, you're surrounded with friends that don't know who Jesus is. That's why it's hard to make it because you got to be around like-minded individuals. The church is God's foundation. God instituted family. He instituted the church for a reason. And this is why those that say, well, I don't go to church. I don't believe in church. And uh, the church, you know, the, you know, and, and the, the church is just taking a bad rep, the building that is. And let me just defend the church on the night. The church building ain't never hurt nobody. Unless the church fell on top of you and, 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 and you know, that type of thing. And, uh, you know, the, the building ain't never hurt nobody. It's the folks in the building. So we that stigma of the church hurt me. Uh, and so I'm not going to go to church. You know, I was listening to an article a few days ago. And I don't really entertain this type of foolishness because people will down or find ways to down. Church hurt is real. Let me just let me just say that church hurt is real. It's, it's real. It's real. Uh, but it's amazing to me how uh, we can get hurt by other things things, but we still go back to those things. You know, your feelings got hurt in the grocery store because that guy was slamming your groceries in the, in the bag, but you did go, you, you still, you still keep going back. 
Uh, yeah, it's, it, you know, you, you, you had a bad experience when you went to that mall, but you still keep going back. Yeah, yeah. Amazon did not deliver your stuff in two days like they said they did, were going to do, uh, but you still keep ordering from them. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you, you, they treat you sometimes, sometimes like dirt on that job, but you still keep clocking in. Well, I got to clock in because um, I got to have a job. Well, they ain't the only job in the world. And it's amazing how we talk so bad about the church. The church, the church, the church. And I am not downplaying church hurt. But it's amazing how so many people have run away from the church when the reality is ain't, the church ain't never hurt nobody. It's the folks that's in the church. And we got to be, you know, we that are in the church, and, it's, you know, and I, I don't want to go this way too far, but I have found that there are more people, you know, most of the time, or a lot of the times, uh, and often, quite often, the people that are talking bad about the church are not even a part of the church. <laughs> They ain't even, you know, they, they don't even go to church and you talk bad about church. You know, uh, how is it that, you know, you talk about something that you don't even really know about and you're not even a part of? But let me move on before, I, you know, anyway. So, so our first purpose in life is to know God and to show love. And then our second purpose is uh, to, to uh, understand that I have been formed uh, in God's family. I've been formed uh, or God formed me for his family. And so when we understand that, we understand that uh, we have to learn and love others. Um, let me say it again. We have to learn and love others. And so when we learn and love others, how do we do this in God's family? In the church, because the church is the laboratory for love. Again, we're not talking about the building. We're talking about the body of believers. So business does not teach us how to love. No, no. Uh, school does not teach us how to love. You can read books, but books do not teach us how to love. Uh, you know, you can read the five love languages. It's a good book to read. But the reality is, uh, if you're going to know what love is, the church is the laboratory for love. The believers is a laboratory for love uh, because God is there. God is not in some schools. God is not in some jobs. He is, in not, he is not in some places of businesses. Uh, and so the church is the laboratory for love. So how do I learn how to love people uh, uh, as, as, I, as we think about living a purpose-filled life? And that's by getting around some unlovely people. How do I learn how to love some folks? Is to uh, love some folks that are unloving. Yeah, that's how I learned how to love is when you're around some unloving people. Uh, who are the unloving people in my life? You got to think about that. Who is unloving in my life? When we think about who is not so loving, uh, so we can think about a few people. Uh, but, but if you can't think about nobody, don't let that person be you. <laughs> because sometimes you may be guilty of being the unloving person. Uh, but but God wants us to love people, uh, or, uh, to love real people, not ideal people. And that, that's very important. He wants us to love people where they're at. You know, I don't care where they come from, what you think they should be. He wants us to love real people, not ideal people. Some people pick and choose who they're going to love, how they're going to love them, where they're going to love them. No, no, no. God wants us to love real people, uh, to do Dwell with those people. We have to love uh, that 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 uh, those individuals. So to dwell with those, we love uh, that will be in glory. Uh, but to dwell below with those, we know that's another story. Let me say it again. To dwell with those, we love that will be in glory. Uh, but to dwell with those, or to dwell below with those, we know that's another story. In other words, it's hard to love people down here. It ain't easy. But if you want to know how to love, get around some unloving people. Um, why do we come, uh, you know, to this earth before we go to glory? Because God could have made us and sent us straight to glory. All right. Uh, but why did he allow us to come to this thing called earth first and then uh, and then we go to glory? Uh, because on earth, he wants us to learn how to love so that when we get to glory, we'll know how to love. So earth is our place where we practice where we learn, where we warm up so that we know how to do it when we get to glory. You don't learn how to do it once you get there, but you got to know how to do it before you get there. Okay. So let me, so, so, so you got to know how to do it before you get there. You can't wait till you get there, but you got to do it while, before you get there. Uh, so the question sometimes we ask, why am I still here? Why am I still here? Why did God take uh, my best friend leave me here. Why did he take whoever? Uh, because there are some things that you and I need to learn. So God would have called some of us home when we were done wrong. You know, uh, uh, then, then, then possibly we might have missed him. 
And, you know, think about that. Whoever offended you in, in life, whoever messed, you know, just did you over, uh, did you wrong, if he would have called you home in that moment, you might have missed heaven because you didn't love. And there's no way that you can see a loving God if you hate. And so we're here because we need to still learn. Because earth is the cultivating ground uh, for heaven. And so we've got to practice down here. This is a dressing up room for up there. Romans 12 and verse 5 says this from the Living Bible Translation. So we belong to each other and each needs all the others. All right. So we belong to each other and each needs all the others. And so we need each other to function as we think about we are in the family of God. So we got to learn how to to love others. We gotta, gotta learn how to love others. After you know who God is, you gotta show love, but then you must learn how to love others. Husbands must love to learn how to love their wives, and wives must learn how to love their husbands, and parents must learn how to love their children, and children must learn how to love their parents. We have to learn, and this not, does not happen just like that. Does not happen just like that. This this love thing is not a microwave thing. No, no, no. You got it's got to be tested and it's got to be tried. And oftentimes, how do you learn how to love people? Is by getting around some folks that are not loving. And I don't know why I'm still snapping my finger, but uh, <laughs> uh, so so we belong to each other, and each needs. All the others. All right, let, let, let's move on here. So, so we understand uh, that we, 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 our first purpose in life is to know God and to show love. And then we've got to understand that we were formed in God's family. Uh, and then we understand that our purpose is to love or to learn to love others. Let's move on here. Uh, so, uh, when we, when we, God wants us to grow up spiritually. All right, God wants us to grow up spiritually, and the model of perfection is Jesus. So after we know who he is, after, and then we're now trying to love others, learning how to love others, uh, we've got to look at how do we do that. Well, we have a perfect model in Jesus Christ because he was the only perfect human being who ever walked the, who ever walked the earth. He lived a perfect life. So God wants us to think like Jesus. He wants us to walk like Jesus. He wants us to talk like Jesus. So every day, our goal and focus, as we said on last week, God, I want to know you better today than I did yesterday. I want to love you more today than I did yesterday. That's how we determine if our day has been productive, if our day has been wasted. If we have not, if we have not learned more about God or loved God more today than we did yesterday, if we did not figure out how to love God more today than we did yesterday, then you wasted a day. Because our whole goal each and every day is, Lord, how can I know you better today and how can I love you more? And so, uh, and so uh, when we talk about our purpose is to learn and to love others, this means that you are in the family. And after you are in the family, God wants you to grow up. So it's not enough to just say I love the Lord, but then are you growing? The Bible tells us to grow in grace. God wants us to grow up. Some people don't ever grow up, and here's the reason why. Because they don't never get in the family of God. If you're not in God's family, you can't grow up. You may think you are. Well, I'm older than I used to be. That don't, that don't mean a thing. In order for us to grow up, we got to be in the family of God. Uh, uh, sometimes our expectations of people are too high because when, 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 when you do not know who Jesus is, you will never come into true maturity. And that's why with some older people, uh, or some adults, shall I say, you constantly have to remind them, don't do this. This is how you talk to folks. This is how you do. And the reality is that, that that's a sign of there's a lack somewhere. Because unless there is a disability uh, or something of that nature, you should, you don't, no one should have to tell you how to do. Uh, that's what God, that, that's, that's what he does. But, it, you know, but when you're having to remind adults how to treat adults, that's a lack of maturity. And so we, you'll never come into true, true maturity if you're not in the family because you can only grow in Jesus. And so God is more interested in who we are rather than what we do. Oh, I'm a deacon. Oh, I'm a trustee. Oh, I'm a choir member. Oh, I'm a pastor. Oh, I'm a bishop. Oh, I'm a apostle. No, no, no. That's beautiful, but God is more interested in who you are 
rather than what you do. Why? Because you taking your car or your cash or your career is a beautiful thing, but it can't go with you to heaven. You, it's a beautiful thing that you got a nice car. It's a beautiful thing you got a lot of cash. It's a beautiful thing you got a good career, but you can't take it to heaven. When you die, the only thing that goes with you is your character. God is interested in who we are, our character, what is inside of us rather than what we do. So, um, you know, when we think about uh, that, uh, we understand that as we pass through earth, as we pass through earth, we, we should be constantly growing and maturing in the things of God. So the woman or man that you became is what or become is what is what goes to heaven. So we pass through this thing called earth so that we can grow up and grow up in Jesus because our character goes with us. Not our career, not our cash, not our car. Romans 8 and 29 from the Living Bible Translation says it like this. For from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him and all along he knew who could should become like his son. So in other words, God knows who's going to come. He knows, uh, you know, who would accept him. He knows who is, who, he knows those that are his. And so when we think about that, uh, it's important for us to understand that he has created us so that we can become more like Jesus. So our goal should be more like Jesus, to be more like Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 uh, uh, from the uh, message version says, We look at this son and see the God who cannot uh, be seen. I uh, lost my place there. The screen Let me say it again. We look at this son and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this son and see God's original purpose in everything created. So when we look at God's creation, we see him. So it says, when we look at his son and see, we see God. It says, and see the God who cannot be seen. So God cannot be seen, but when we look at his son, we can see God. And our goal is to be more like Jesus. So if we dissect the scripture, it says, we look at his son and see the God who cannot be seen. So when I look at Jesus, I see God who I cannot see. So if I'm becoming more like Jesus, then I'm becoming more like God. You're not becoming God, but you're becoming more like him. We look at his son and see God's original purpose in everything created. We will never, hear me when I say this, become a God or goddess. And I don't know where this uh, this newness is coming from where people, I'm a God, I'm a goddess. No, you're not. Uh, there's only one God. Uh, but, 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 but it, because the fact of the matter is, if we were God and goddesses, goddesses, uh, then the fact of the matter would be that we could solve, our, we could solve our own problems. If you so much of a God or a goddess, why have you not figured out, you know, uh, how to accomplish the goals and dreams that you have? The fact of the matter is, we're not gods and we're not goddesses. Uh, he, there's only one. And this is where the first lie was been, was told. Because we go back and look at the creation story. Satan told Eve that if you eat this fruit, you'll become as God. And that was the greatest deception. It was the first lie. Now hear me when I say this. When Satan told Eve that if you eat of this fruit, God had already told them they had access to everything, but you cannot eat of the tree of knowledge, all right? Um, and so he says, uh, 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 you know, don't eat of this, don't eat, don't eat from this tree. And Satan convinces Eve uh, that if you eat of this fruit, uh, eat from this tree, you'll be like God. Now, this deception is the first lie that was ever been told, and it's the oldest lie that people still believe in. Because uh, people now believe that they can be like God. Well, since I'm more like him, I am him. No, you're not. There's only one God. And so God created us so we can become more like Jesus, but we're not, we're not Jesus and we're not God. So God does not want us to become a God. He wants us to be godly, expressing the characteristics of who God is. And what does this mean? Uh, we should tell the truth like God. We should love like God. We should be faithful like God. We should be patient and forgiving like God. We should become a God in character, or we should become, excuse me, like God in character. 
our character should reflect the God in whom we serve. And so uh, the greatest question of all time is why? We're constantly asking why. You know, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening right now? Why does this happen like it is? Uh, why? And the answer to that is to make you more like Jesus. That's why life happens the way that it does. That's why it happened the way that it did, so that you could be more like Jesus. So if God desires for us to be more like Jesus, then we're going to have to go through just like Jesus went through. He was not spared from difficulty. He was lonely. He was neglected. He was rejected. He was disappointed. The Bible says he came to his own and he didn't even receive him. And the, the scripture tells us that a prophet is without honor in his own hometown. So oftentimes it's, where it's your own folks that reject you. And so if Jesus went through that and we're striving to be more like him and that's what God wants us to be, you're going to be rejected. You're going to be neglected. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be discouraged. And so if Jesus went through it, so will we. But the good news is that the Bible says that he came, overcame all temptation, the Bible says, without sin. And so that gives us good news is that as we become more like him, it increases our strength and our faith, our stability. So we're able to stick, stand and stay with him for the long haul. And this is why so many people are falling by the wayside and trickling and trickling and trickling and trickling and trickling and trickling. And trickling. Why? Because they can't stand a little bit of rain in their life because they're not real. They're not really in it to be more like Jesus uh, because we've come to this conclusion. Well, I'm going to be more like Jesus up until a certain point. You know, I can't, I, no, I, no, 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 you got to deny yourself. That's what he says. If any man come out to me, let him deny himself. First thing you got to do, take up your cross, then follow. And notice, notice he says, if, if, preposition, if. In other words, it's conditional. If you're going to do this, you got to do this, that, and the third. So God is more interested in our character than he is our comfort. And uh, this life that we live is not a life of comfort. We have moments where we have comfort. You know, there are times where things are comfortable for us. There, where there are moments where we experience comfortability. But the reality is we will never experience a forever comfort. We will never experience comfort in its totality until we get into glory. We have moments of comfort on this side. And we like to be comfortable. Uh, but the life of the believer is not a life of comfort. Because uh, foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head in. So when we think about that, we as the believers, oftentimes we complain about why is it always me? Why they always get on? Why not you? Because if you're going to be more like Jesus, you're going to have to go through just like he did. We are, right now, we are in the present, which lets us know we are living in the classroom side of this thing called life. We have not crossed into eternity. And so the question is, if we are in the classroom side, what have you learned up until this point in time? What have I learned and what am I learning right now? Because as a believer, if my goal is to love God more and to know God more, I should constantly be evolving and learning more of him. And so what have I learned and what am I learning right now? Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 from the New Century Version says, In your lives, you must think and act like Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. What is Jesus like? Uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 through 23. We see the fruit of the Spirit. Not fruits, but the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, New Living, from the New Living Translation, uh, uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 through 23 says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Set in the nine things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we have love, we have joy, we have peace, we have patience, we have kindness, we have goodness, we have faithfulness, we have gentleness, self-control. And I'm missing one, because it should be nine. Wait a minute, Colin. Well, let me let me pick this back up from the King James Version. All right, let me read that from the King James Version because it should be nine. So we have, Lord, we have love, we have joy, we have peace, we have long-suffering, we have gentleness, we have goodness, and then we have faith. 
We have meekness, and then we have temperance. All right, so those, those, those oh, cause I was about to, I was to say, wait a minute now, I can't count. <laughs> so those are the, so when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, there are nine things that it produces. Nine things that the fruit of the Spirit produces. And so the question is that we got, the, the question that we must ask ourselves, the question that we must ask ourselves as believers in Christ Jesus, if we're going to be what he calls us to be and do what he causes us to do, do I possess the fruit of the Spirit? Am I a fruit bearer? Am I a fruit bearer? Do I bear fruit? Because there should be some love. There should be some joy. There should be some patience. There should be some kindness. There should be some goodness. There should be some faithfulness. There should be some gentleness. And there should be self-control. There should there, These qualities should be there. There are nine. There are nine qualities that, that, that should be as a believer. Uh, and if you look at New Living Translation, what it does is it combines that one, that last one into two into one. Uh, but we, from the King James Version, we can see very clearly that there are nine. And so when we look at those, the fruit of the Spirit, these are the attributes, the characteristics of Christ. So we should love if the fruit of spirit, if, if, if the fruit of spirit is love, then we should love what? Like Jesus. If the fruit of spirit is joy, we should have joy like Jesus. If the fruit of spirit is peace, we should have peace like all these things should be like Jesus. So, so as we as we continue to think about how how God desires for us to be uh, like Jesus, uh, let's 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 uh, get here. Uh, and 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 because uh, we've gone over the time frame here, uh, how does God make us like Jesus? Uh, because patience doesn't come in the form of appeal. So we talk about fruit of spirit and patience is one of them. Well, you can't find it in the book uh, because uh, the fact of the matter is becoming like Jesus is a lifelong process, better known as discipleship. And this is one of the reasons why here at the Grove we don't call our um, members, members, we call them disciples because we understand that a disciple is a lifelong thing, right? That doesn't mean you are going to be here forever, but what it means is that you are, we are disciples of Christ. We are, and you, they, you know, uh, attached, to this, uh, attached to this local assembly. So uh, the lifelong process is known as discipleship. So our first purpose is to know God and to show love. And then, so that's worship. When we talk about knowing God and showing love, that's worship. And then when we talk about how we should learn and learn to love others, that's fellowship. And then when we talk about uh, becoming one like Jesus, that is discipleship. So to know and to love God, we've got to learn and to we got to learn to love others and grow up in Christ. So God often places us in positions and situations where uh, so that we can possess those things that He desires for us to have. So if He's teaching me love, He's gonna place me around some folks that are not loving. So that I can learn how to love. Uh, he'll place me around some irritating folks so I can learn how to love. If he's teaching me joy, he's going to be placing me in some situations where I may not have some joy. So it will produce joy. Are you following what I'm saying? God will place you in some situations so that it will produce the fruit of the Spirit. So if God is teaching me patience, then he's going to test me. So he may place me in an irritable situation, i.e. Uh, at the DMV <laughs> with a long line. That's when you got to have some patience. In the doctor's office, that's when you got to have some patience. Have you ever been in a hurry and God won't? <laughs> Stuck in traffic, you got to have some patience. So God, in order for us to obtain these things, he'll place us in opposite situations. So God makes character in our life. That's why we have oftentimes problems. Because God is wanting to do something in us, and so he'll place us in, in opposite situations to produce what he wants in our lives. So life is not about us. We understand that, that the life that we live is not about us. It's all about Jesus. As we look at 2 Corinthians, as we hurry and hasten to a close, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says from the New Living Translation, And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. In other words, it does not happen overnight. It is, when we talk about discipleship, it is a lifelong process. 
We are on the potter's wheel. And he's shaping us. He's molding us into what he wants us to be. You can't get off the wheel because it's uncomfortable. Stay on the wheel so that he can make you and give you what he wants us to have. And so as we as we end this session of our um, Wednesday Wednesday now, the question that we got to ask ourselves is is as we think about living a purpose filled life, living a purpose filled life, what do I need to do in my life? What do I need to do in my life to make sure that it's purpose filled? I I don't want to just live life. And live life any kind of way. I want to live a purpose filled life. I want my life to be filled. And full of purpose. In order for me. To have a purpose filled life. Christ has got to be the center of my attention. He's got to be my center focus. So as always. Throw, throw, throw those prayer, prayer requests. In the in the chat, chat thread. We're praying for you. We, we pray that something's been said and done. Or, or said rather. Uh, to encourage you on tonight as we talk about living a purpose-filled life. Uh, with the help of the Lord, we'll, we will get to where God wants us to be. But this discipleship is a lifelong process. So as you're putting those uh, comments or those prayer requests in the thread, or in the box, whatever you want to call it, know that we're praying for you. So as we go to God in prayer, Lord, we thank you for time well spent. Thank you that we can live a purpose-filled life and how grateful we are to be called your son and daughters. Thank you for adoption. Thank you, God, for being a member of your family. Help us, God, to hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you, creating us a clean heart, renew the right spirit within us. And God, we pray, Lord, for every viewer that's watching right now live or watching the recap. God, we pray the Lord, you would just Hear and answer the prayers as only you can. Father, we know as we strive to be more like you that Satan will come. And he desires to sift us. But Lord, we know that as we continue to stay connected to you, that God, that you'll give us what we need. And God, we ask the Lord that you give us uh, patience, give us love, give us joy, give us the fruit of the spirit. That God, that we will be those living epistles, read of men, God, that uh, somebody will see you in us. That they'll come crying. What must I do? Be what? What must I do to be saved? And Lord, we ask you to bless uh, those that are going through tough times. Those that are going through grief and bereavement. And we know that you're the God of all comfort. You sit high, you look low. And God, we know that you are the solution. You are the antidote for everything that we need. So God, we thank you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank God. Amen. Well, God bless you. We thank God for another Wednesday. Now, uh, tune in and join us next week. Know that we love you with the love of God. And know that we're praying for you. And uh, I don't know about you all, uh, but as we are in this month of August, the eighth month, which is a uh, significant month because it's new beginnings, I am just expecting God for great things. And I hope that you are doing the same, expecting God for great things. But if you're expecting God to do great things, then you got to position yourself to receive that which uh, you believe God is going to do for you. So till uh, this time next week, God bless you, God keep you. Uh, may heaven smile upon you. Have a good night. Oh, my God.